Hello folks at Low Carb Down Under. I am, my name is Nina Teichels. I'm a science journalist and author and the founder of the group, the Nutrition Coalition, which is a nonprofit dedicated to ensuring that dietary policy is evidence-based, which is to say based on rigorous clinical trial evidence. And I'm delighted to be talking to you. Thank you, Rod Taylor, for inviting me. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful conference. I know it'll be great. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of my previous research, some new research that I'm doing, and basically the theme that is tying everything together is why is nutrition advice so wrong? Why is it so out of sync with the science? And I think the only way to really understand this is not uh, innocent incompetence, but I think there are a number of forces working behind the scenes that influence nutrition science, and it's been my work really more intensively recently to try to uncover and document some of those influences so they really can be better understood. So just to review, here are the US dietary guidelines. This is the food pyramid. We now use an image called my plate, but this is the one that I think best expresses what our guidelines recommend, that big bottom slab of grains, breads, much smaller proportion for animal foods and the teeny tiny amount of fat in the tip of the pyramid. Um, you know, even though our government doesn't call it a low fat diet anymore, it is de facto low fat. And to look at our guidelines another way, you can see that it, is, it recommends six servings of grains per day, including inexplicably three servings of refined grains and up to 10% of calories as sugar. Although in school meals, there's uh, no limit on the amount of sugar that children can be served because we want to do especially well by that population apparently. And then five and a half teaspoons of seed oils, uh, and that is instead of saturated fats, which are capped at 10% of calories. Looking at this another way, it's over 50% of calories as carbohydrate, and uh, the best available data for America in 1965 was that we were eating um, less than 40% of our calories as carbohydrate. So that's a huge shift. I think it's increased since 19. 70 an increase of 25% of our calories as carbohydrate. It's just been a tremendous change in the way that people have eaten worldwide and it cor correlates with a huge increase in obesity. So obesity uh, before the guidelines were started in 1980 obesity was at 12 13% and now it is uh, well it's officially at almost 43% but that's a number from 2016. The, the number hasn't been updated since, so I think it's safe to say we're probably close to 50% now of our country having uh, overweight or ob obesity. Sorry, this is a chart for overweight and, obes and obesity together. That's now at 77%. Obesity is, I would guess, at around 50% now. And in Australia, your guidelines look very much the same as ours with a heavy emphasis on greens and a relatively quite a small sliver there for all for animal foods um, and then some more for dairy. So one of my first attempts to really study rigorously why our guidelines were so off was I initiated a study, the first ever systematic review of all the conflicts of interest on the US Dietary Guideline Advisory Committee. That's the expert group in charge of reviewing the science for the guidelines appointed. There's a new group appointed every five years as with each new iteration of the guidelines, we looked at the committee for the current guidelines, uh, which are the 2020 to 2025. Anyway, here's what we found. 95% of the members on the committee had conflicts of interest with a food or pharmaceutical in company. More than half had 30 such conflicts or more. One advisor alone, Sharon Donovan, accounted for more than 152 ties. <laughs> She's the blonde in the bottom row. And the most common ties were to Nestle, Dannon, General Mills, and Kellogg's, uh, giant multinational ultra-processed food manufacturers. General Mills and Kellogg's are cereal, uh, principally cereal companies. And then the single greatest number of ties was with the International Life Sciences Institute, which is a food lobbying group, a food industry lobbying group founded by an ex-vice president of Coca-Cola and same familiar names there, Unilever, Coke, Pepsi, Kellogg's, General Mills are among their 
industry members, which are mostly multinationals. So you can see that this expert group is has with such close connections to industry. Uh, it's, I think, difficult for them to do science that is truly in the public interest. Um, and that's and we see those results in our guidelines. So the Nutrition Coalition also did an analysis of the of the USDA office that is directly oversees the guidelines and we found that it had at least 100 partnerships with uh, ultra processed food companies, which is amazing. I mean, this is the, these memberships, sorry, these partnerships include monthly meetings, supporting the guidelines, and I think as best as I know reflects a measure of regulatory capture uh, at the USDA, it, at least with um, regard to the guidelines. So that's some of the work I did previously. I'm now doing a column on a platform called Substack, and the column is called Unsettled Science. And I want to do a number of things there, including giving nutrition advice, but I really want to focus on trying to draw back the curtain so that people can see the forces and the conflicts that are behind our trusted scientists and institutions. Um, and, and, I, and I want to really try to document some of the conflicts of interest out there. Here's one of the columns I did. It's on uh, the leader at Harvard. His name is Walter Willett. He was, um, he was the head of the nutrition department there for more than 25 years. And Harvard is just so important because, you know, it's Harvard. And it's also very influential in the nutrition space. When I interviewed hundreds of scientists for my book, they said Walter Willett is easily the most influential person in nutrition science. Harvard runs two large observational studies that just churn out constant papers showing an association, usually associations between some bad thing and animal foods and some good thing and plant foods. And when I dug into Walter Willett's history, I found that he has very long, since 1990, he's been a believer, really a believer, because there's no science then and there's, there's no science now, but certainly no science in 1990 for a vegetarian diet. And he was saying, even in 1990, why don't you give up meat and give yourself a gold star, an optimal diet has very little meat or chicken. Um, I also uncovered his connections to, uh, I don't know if you know, recognize this guy, probably not, Ansel Keys, um, the author of the Diet Heart Hypothesis, the grandfather of the idea that we should all limit saturated fat and cholesterol in order to fight heart disease. And Walter Willett had a picture of him uh, shaking Ansel Keys's hand on his office wall when I went to visit him at Harvard. Uh, so he considers Ansel Keys one of his guiding stars. And certainly, uh, Walter Willett has carried on this uh, tradition of using weak science to make strong recommendations. So what else did I find out about Walter Willett? And why has Harvard been anti-meat for more than 30 years? Um, I also found out that another influence was Walter Willett's connection to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He had been an advisor to the Blue Zones, which is uh, advocates a, a mostly plant diet and was acquired by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for $140 million some years ago. He has been an advisor to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, a group also very, very closely tied to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, and he has many other connections to groups that are promoting vegetarian vegan diets. And I also uncovered a, a third, I, I don't know if it's an influence on his thinking, but he certainly has uh, now at least a, a pretty significant financial incentives that to show benefits from plant-based foods. And so there's a list of some of the uh, donations that have been made to the Harvard School of Public Health, um, also from pharmaceutical companies. They give money ranges because they won't say so anything specifically. And they've only been issuing these financial disclosures uh, since I think 2017. So we really don't know that much about um, who is financing Harvard's work. But one of the things I found, for instance, is that they get a lot of money from tree nuts, you know, peanuts, almonds, pecans, every kind of nut. 
And then in the time that they were receiving those donations or that we know that we, we could document they were receiving donations, they came out with eight separate papers showing the benefits of nuts for this or that health condition. So, um, so you know, whether there's a pay for play science going on there, I don't know, but um, it's clearly a conflict of interest uh, for, for Harvard. Uh, the other, I also talk about and document Walter Willett's um, history of bullying nutritional scientists that disagree with him. So when some papers came out about uh, that said like actually meat was okay, these came out in the Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, very in important papers. They were the most rigorous review that had ever been done on all the meat data looking at cancer, metabolic outcomes, um, mortality, and heart disease, they, and finding really a minuscule amount of evidence and no effect of meat on these conditions or very little effect. Walter Willett uh, presented this disinformation triangle at a number of lectures where he, um, he made fun of the evidence-based academics. Gordon Guyatt mentioned there is the co-founder of evidence-based medicine. Um, and he, you know, he, it's basically a, I think a kind of slur attempt on people who were challenging his science. And there are other bullying incidents that I report on in my piece. And you know who really began the whole tradition of bullying scientists he didn't agree with was Ansel Keys, um, who, as I write about in my book, I mean, he just went on and on and on and uh, in criticizing scientists who disagreed with him, most notably, I guess, John Yudkin, um, who was challenging uh, Ansel Keys because you can believe that sugar was actually the cause of heart disease and obesity. Uh, here's another piece that I did on um, Christopher Gardner at Stanford. He is on the current U.S. Dietary Guideline Expert Committee. He served on expert committees at the American Heart Association, very influential nutrition scientist. He's a vegan. He's an ideological vegan. He doesn't believe in eating meat and for um, animal rights reasons and now climate reasons, uh, which he states openly. And he And he runs a center that I guess pretends to do clinical trials, objective clinical trials, but <clears throat> they're all of his trials are, uh, I guess it's fair to say rigged to show an advantage for a vegan diet while showing the least advantage for the other diet. His first study, interestingly, he did his first and longest trial that he did um, was a head to head diet trial that showed that the low carb diet was the best. Um, and after that, he, I guess, figured out how to design trials so that um, they no longer had those results. What did I find out about him? Additionally, his entire center is funded by Beyond Meat, which is a fake meat company um, that's been backed by Bill Gates and, and others, and which is just a giant conflict of interest that nobody really talks about. Um, and even after my piece came out, None of the press reports that include quotes by him will ever mention that he's completely funded by Beyond Meat. I mean, imagine if a nutrition scientist was funded by, say, like Cargill Meats. Their entire center was funded by Cargill Meat. And, uh, and can you imagine sort of the reporting that would exclude anything? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that that would not be in the first line um, describing that scientist whenever he was quoted, or she. Here's another story I did on carnivore, where I wanted to look at the just incredibly unfair portrayals of, uh, of men, really. Most, all, all men, carnivores portrayed as being entirely men, men who are just gym bros and only care about their physiques and do crazy things like eat raw liver. And I went back and interviewed the original, um, you know, people who were involved in carnivore back on the original chat boards who really founded the, the movement and, you know, many women among them and who makes up the carnivore community about half women. It's really a lot of women, mostly middle aged women who are suffering from an unbelievable range of horrible chronic diseases and the carnivore diet is not something that they necessarily want to do, but it is life-saving for them. So 
I think that's just a really interesting, compelling story. And I talk about why there is such a bias towards carnivore, um, which just is pervasive in the media and I think so unfair. So this is the last column I'm going to share with you. Um, really, was one of, it was one of my first, which is why are we basing food policy on black box data? And it referred to something called the Global Burdens of Disease Study, which we in the US don't know that much about, but it's hugely influential in Europe, especially policy in the European Union. So the UK and at the global level um, policy, it's it studies uh, disease internationally. It's a $380 million study at the University of Washington backed almost entirely or exclusively by the Bill Gates Foundation. And in 2019, it had come out in the Lancet with this claim that no amount of red meat was safe. So, and that claim made it into all kinds of policy documents in Europe. Um, just in 2017, two years before, they had judged red meat to be the least likely to cause disease, and now it was completely unsafe in any amount. So, a group of academics challenged that 2019 finding. They were very persistent. I mean, I, I urge you to read this piece just because it shows how hard people have to work to try to correct the science. And uh, in March 2022, the Global Burdens of Disease authors said, oh, you're right, we got it wrong in that 2019 paper. Uh, and in my interview with the study director, Christopher Murray, he said, yes, we did make errors. We, um, I forget the exact nature of the errors, but I mean, not small errors. And the whole, the reason I call it a black box is that the whole process, they don't show their work. It's like, you know, in maths, in maths you have to show your work in order to uh, explain how you got to your solution. In science, it's even more important so that you're, conclusions can be in, independently validated, but they do not say how they come to their their uh, conclusions. They just say, we put it in the box and this is what came out. And obviously it was flawed. I think one of the most sobering things about this story is that they did not retract the paper. The Lancet did not insist on their retracting the paper. The head of the Lancet said, it's up to the authors to retract the paper, which is actually not how it works. The journal itself could have forced retraction. So, I mean, I think you can see here, well, a couple of things. One is just the incredible bias against meat and for a plant-based diet and how that bias exists at the highest levels of our institutions and how that bias is funded and fueled by the food industry. Uh, who don't benefit if you are, uh, they don't benefit if you're eating whole natural foods, they make their money off of ultra processed foods and so demonizing uh, natural whole foods is not in their interest, is in their interest. It's not in their interest for you to get healthy. The pharmaceutical industry also has an obvious interest in, um, they profit off of people who are chronically sick. So, uh, I, so my the purpose of my work, which is probably, you know, like a Cassandra in the wind warning people, but I want to document all of these forces at work. And, um, you know, my hope is that serious people will recognize this and will um, hopefully that will lead to change and action. So, um, you know, I think at the moment I might be one of the only journalists uh, in the world doing this kind of <laughs> thankless work, but I, I, you know, I think it's important and worthwhile and I just urge you to take some time to read it if it interests you. So thank you for listening to me and I hope you have a really, really great conference. Okay, bye-bye.